All right, I've had a lot of questions asked about what is gouache. So I will get Ron to make the <laughs> spell it out for you. It's a French term. It is opaque watercolor. That's it. It is watercolor that has uh, Chinese white, for instance, added to it to, to make it opaque, which means that you can't see through it. That makes it different from regular watercolor because with regular watercolor, if I draw with a pen and then I paint over it, I'm going to be able to see that pen line. It's transparent like glass. With something that's opaque, if I paint over that pen line, I either will only be able to see it a little bit or mostly not at all. Opaque means you can't see through it. So you're thinking glass versus wall. Um, one of the things uh, I found an uh, interesting term or comparison uh, to use with in thinking about how you apply gouache is to think of the viscosity, the thickness. And someone compared it to tea, coffee, milk, cream, and butter. So I made myself a little color chart just with the thickness of the paint, trying to create it watery like tea, and then a little less watery like coffee, and then a little more like milk, and so more pigment, less water, until it's almost out of the tube, which is buttery, and that's where you get the end, or the next to the end column. And I put a black mark so I could actually um, compare the two, and sure enough, by the time I got to the end, I could barely see the black lines. Yellow and the, the two yellows, I could see the black line because yellow tends to be a transparent color, even though this is opaque paint. So using that, it gave me some information as to how I could manipulate it on my paintings. So instead of using my palette knife, like I usually do for my oils, I use very small brushes because these are small pieces. They are very intimate, uh, thinking more in terms of Persian miniatures. And um, you buy the uh, gouache in tubes. I don't know if they come in pans or not, but most people buy them in tubes. You can buy sets or buy your own. And I actually also bought a large tube of titanium white because it is more opaque than zinc white, which is what comes with the kits when you buy them. So using a lot of this, I used one of my old watercolor palettes. And I just squirted it out at the top and along the side. And then the plastic surface doesn't allow the paint to stick very well. So all this little texture you see is as the paint kind of beads up in it. And to do the work, I actually fill a little container with water and take an eye drop. Pick up the water and just re-wet the pans just a little bit so it maintains its thickness. And then I keep doing that as it dries because gouache dries really fast, even more than watercolors, um, which makes it a little difficult to use, for instance, if you're painting outside because it dries so quickly. I also used watercolor paper. You can uh, use just regular paper if it's very stiff. So I've used Bristol board, which is like a heavy cardboard, and I've used a watercolor pad, like you see here. Just drew it with the lines with pencil and then paint it in. And for the exhibit, I deliberately left the outside like this image rather than keeping the uh, image close to the pencil line. I ended up um, allowing the brush to go outside and then when I matted it, I matted it larger so that those brush strokes become part of the image rather than obliterating that by covering it up. And that's basically it. The other thing is if you've never used gouache before, all I can say is practice a lot because you can lift it. It can do a lot of things, um, but it can't do a lot of things and you need to practice. And that I did a lot of just dabs on paper, just seeing how long I could do lines. Just I have sheets of nothing but just dabs of paper and wiping over and see what happens before I felt like I could go ahead and go in and use it. And then I did. Okay. Um, well, one common theme that goes through all of my artwork, whatever medium or whatever subject, is the idea of conservation, for lack of a better word. My, my parents both grew up poor in the Depression in the Texas Panhandle and they learn to save and reuse everything. And so that's a big part of what I do. And so painters go out and buy paint. Collage artists collect paper. And I don't ever buy paper. Paper just comes to me. I mean, think about how much paper comes in your house at any given time. So I try to reuse it. Um, I use a lot of envelopes because it's just a nice layer of pattern. 
Um, some of these I've just gotten recently. This was Linda's that she gave me a flash drive in and I kept the envelope because it was so beautiful. Um, tissue paper I use a lot of. Paper bags. This is a Taco Bell bag that I, after the opening Friday, I went through the drive-thru of Taco Bell. And I almost threw this away. I don't usually save um, food bags because they tend to be greasy, but I just thought this pattern which is the bell if you look at it the right direction. And the colors are so beautiful. So that will be something I'll paint over. This is um, actually cash register tape. I have people who save the ends of rolls for me. Um, so after I collect all this paper, then I start marking it. And I also, my tools that I use tend to be things that I've salvaged. Um, you know, this is, I think there was sushi in this. Um, cookies came in these little boxes that I cut up. Um, of course, bags of onions and potatoes and lemons. Um, my husband works at a hardware store and saves me a lot of the packaging. I think this was from a ratchet set. Something was in here. Um, and then of course, bubble wrap, which is so wonderful. Um, this I worked on Saturday and drove home and got a shrimp roll at Tan A Market and so I saved the bottom of the the tray and scored it so I have that pattern. So then I start building a pattern. Um, There's no one way to do it. I like to work layers and so this piece has four different layers on it. The, the pattern of the, of the envelope, two different ways of bubble wrap and also I was in the print shops so I had a brayer and I rolled off my brayer so there's just a little hint of color from what was left on the brayer. Um, I said earlier painters have paint. Well when I first start a concept, um, a series, the first thing I do is just build up a palette of paper. So I spend a couple of months just decorating paper until I have a, a suitable um, collection of patterns and colors that work, work for me. Natural dyeing has always been an interest for me. I took a class with my dad actually when I was 10 at the University of Colorado where we went around and, and collected things and made dyes. And um, so I don't do it as a, it's more of a, it's a casual hobby more than anything else. I tend to, I was a quilter for a long time so I saved materials, I made clothes, so I saved scraps from that. And I, I dye with what's around me. Um, I'm, I have in my yard, not intentionally, but I have a lot of goldenrod and a lot of poke and those both make beautiful dyes. Acorns, I have a white oak tree, so I've got a lot of acorns. That makes a lovely gray silver uh, rust from old nails. The only problem with rust is that it, it degrades the fabric, so you have to be really careful about that. Um, hibiscus tea is trendy now and hibiscus makes a beautiful lavender and so I'm, I'm trying to use more of that in my work. It's um, more of the natural dyes. So and the, the piece in the show is one that features almost entirely natural light fabric. We'd like to thank Linda and Jan for putting this exhibition together. And you can actually see it live and in person until Sunday, November the 8th.